Welcome to all participants in this historic webinar. We are very grateful that you have registered in large numbers for today. It is encouraging to see such high levels of interest in the work of the Club of Rome because the work we do matters for all of humanity and our mother earth. We are also mindful that we are in the midst of the complex challenges of conflicts over who controls what resources. Welcome to our esteemed guest speaker, Dennis Meadows, and our diverse panel of great people who will bring such richness to our perspectives and discussions. This is a momentous occasion. Today, we commemorate the release 50 years ago of the Limits to Growth report. That report triggered huge interest and debate across many parts of the world, especially in countries in Europe, and North America. The Club of Rome has learned important lessons over the last 50 years, that humanity is interconnected and interdependent as part of the web of life. And that science alone is not enough to mobilize people for transformative action. Our interconnected and interdependent world is being sorely tested by the ongoing conflicts over the power to control the limited natural and other resources. We know from ancient wisdom that there is enough for all of our needs as humanity, but not enough for the greed that drives overconsumption. The Club of Rome has chosen the frame for this 50th anniversary of the, the Limits to Growth being global equity for a healthy planet in order to signal that we need to take a long-term view as leaders and citizens and do everything every day with the next generation in mind. We look forward to hearing your interesting perspectives and the many, many issues that will be raised here. I now hand over to my co-president, Sandrine dixon Ditlev, to add her welcome and to lead us on. Over to you, Sandrine. Thank you so much, Mampela, and welcome, as Mampela so rightly says, to all of you calling in from all over the world. We've had upwards of 750 registrations for today's important webinar. And truly what we wanted to do today was to not only think through this incredible legacy, but to understand also why the limits to growth and the 50 years of thought leadership coming from not only the members of the Club of Rome, but those thought leaders across the globe who are trying to every day look at the human predicament. Today is a bittersweet celebration for all of us. Some of us are very acutely aware of the war that is on our doorstep, those of us that are living in Europe, but there are many other conflicts across the globe. All of these for us are rooted in systemic failures that must now be addressed collectively. And this collective need of the human family and all species is something that was started in the reflections of the limits to growth, but has truly been the core of the thinking of the Club of Rome since. And maybe let me close as I then pass it over to our esteemed speaker, Dennis Meadows himself, the lead author of The Limits to Growth. 
A few days ago, we issued the Club of Roma statement around the importance of focusing our efforts collectively on the greatest existential threat to humanity, which is not only the challenge of war, but the challenges of climate change, of pandemics and of social tipping points. And we said very clearly, and I quote, it is as if we are all on a ship headed towards an iceberg, which is simultaneously on fire, and instead of navigating the ship and putting out the fire, we start fighting amongst ourselves. Focusing on an us and them divide, including racist utterances and practices only perpetuate conflict, enhances division and delays collective action on the current global challenges before us. There is little time to address these challenges before they move beyond humanity's capacity to influence. Our deep desire in opening up this very important webinar on this incredible day of the 50th anniversary of the Limits to Growth is to ensure that we collectively as thought leaders across the globe can think through the greatest predicaments hitting mankind and move forward collectively with the solutions and the reflections that are necessary. So without any further ado, I would like to open up the floor to our deep, deep esteemed speaker for today, Dennis Meadows, Emeritus Professor at the University of New Hampshire, Director of the Institute for Policy and Social Science Research, clearly the author, lead author of The Limits to Growth and the incredible MIT team. For all your work, Dennis, that you have done, thank you for joining us. The floor is yours. So thank you, Sundreen. Thank you, Mom Fellow. Uh, I appreciate the Club of Rome organizing this session. Thanks a lot to Till for getting all the logistics uh, set up. It's uh, been fun for me. I, uh, thinking back over the past 50 years, actually today is the 50th anniversary of the publication of Limits to Growth. The birth of Limits to Growth was a Club of Rome meeting up in Canada at Montebello, where uh, our team first presented its preliminary results to all the Club of Rome members. I think that was in 1970. And uh, so I've enjoyed the opportunity to kind of think back and, and try to understand how I could use time usefully today. Uh, it's been 50 years. There's been 10 books, uh, thousands of speeches, dozens of videos, uh, interviews, and so forth. And I have 10 minutes, so I'm going to have to uh, cut out a little bit uh, and stick with the essence. Uh, just I have to share my screen. Okay. So can you see my screen? It's coming. Yeah, just a minute. <laughs> uh, your screen sharing. So sorry, it's interesting. One of the interesting things about the last 50 years is when I first did this, all we had was overhead projection with plastic <laughs> slides. And uh, I've done my best to keep up here, but so uh, just want to. So yeah. do you now see something intelligent? It still says it started screen sharing, but no, I still can't see it. Starts. Can anyone else see it? No. no. Oh, come on. Here we go. Okay. There. There okay. we go. It's coming. It's, it's coming. It's coming. Oh, this moment. Uh, and we're already starting to get questions. So please do yeah. send in your questions. Thank you to David and Sebastian who are already sending in questions. If that is Sir David King, it's such a pleasure to have you with us today. Okay. So this is of course about the limits to growth uh, and past and future. So last 50 years, next 50 years. I won't be around to celebrate the 100th anniversary, but some of you will, and I hope uh, you'll be proud of uh, what's been accomplished. In March 2nd, 1972, I stood up, yes, that's me at the podium, uh, 
addressing a group of diplomats and others uh, about our preliminary findings. You'll know that's Aurelio Pache, the founder of the Club of Rome, and two of my colleagues, Jorgen Ronders and uh, Bill Behrens. Donella, who actually was a principal author of the book, is just barely visible uh, around the corner of the podium on the right there. I was uh, very worried about that presentation because it seemed to me that the main ideas would be totally obvious to everybody. And I was really worried about occupying an hour of all these important people's times uh, by summarizing what we had done. But I did uh, rehearse the study and as it turned out, it wasn't obvious at all. The notion that the planet is finite and that growth can't go on forever, which we took into the study, is only now after 50 years beginning uh, to emerge as a, a basis for conversation. So in 19, and of course things have changed a lot in 50 years. In 1972, uh, we made three main points. Present growth policies for global material consumption can't continue. And I stress here the term policies. I'm not talking about trends. Of course, the trends can't continue. But even the policies which were producing those trends uh, couldn't stay in place uh, for a sustainable world. And we, with our scenarios, showed the different results that those policies would produce. If they, those policies didn't change, we said uh, back then that uh, the most likely result would be overshoot and decline, not immediately, but within uh, the early to mid part of the 20th, uh, uh, 21st century. But that still back in 1972, what we might loosely term a sustainable society was still possible. And we sketched out what that would mean, a stable population, a relatively decent, equitable uh, material standard of living and so forth. And then we made the obvious point, at least it was obvious to us, that if you got started sooner rather than later, you have a better chance of success. And we even in the book showed uh, the consequences of delaying some of these uh, policies uh, by a few years. If uh, we had initiated those policies, then uh, the book, which was published in 1972, could have been a prelude to a global society, which was certainly not utopian, but would at least have been free to focus its energy and resources on other issues. Population was about 3.65 billion uh, back then. We saw that it could conceivably go up uh, to twice. We're well above that level now, of course, and uh, keeping pollution down and so forth. Well, uh, rather than get on with the job, people decided to argue that it wasn't necessary even to consider the matter. And that led us uh, to what is termed the standard run of limited growth. This is figure 35 in the book. We published it back in 1972. At that time, we still anticipated there would be a significant uh, period of time for growth. And indeed, over the last 50 years, uh, on average, not equally distributed, but on average around the globe, there has been a significant expansion. But here we are now in 2022, and those policies, which we didn't change back then, are now going to start producing a different result. And actually, if you read the daily newspapers, uh, you see that uh, illustrated in many different ways. This isn't a prediction, of course. You can't predict what's going to happen in the future, because simply in the process of looking at our options, people make choices, and that alters uh, what the options are going to be. But uh, it turns out uh, a number of independent researchers, uh, for example, Graham Turner down at the Commonwealth Science and Industrial Research Organization in Canberra, Austria, that's uh, Australia's national research entity, and people in other countries as well. Uh, this is uh, results that he published in Gaia, the magazine Gaia, uh, have concluded that this, uh, scenario I'm showing now, unfortunately, 
is the one which is so far best represented um, real world outcomes. And I can say as I look at the world today and try to think what's coming, this particular scenario, although not the precise numbers, uh, it gives me a kind of useful uh, perspective on the matter. The important thing to know is that limits to growth looked at growth. It didn't look at decline. And so if our study had any relevance at all, uh, that relevance lies in the past. That's why I've welcomed uh, the new Club of Rome study. It's endeavoring to start looking at the place we're all going to live, the future. And it's going to need to consider an entirely different set of options, resources, constraints, and goals. Now, from my perspective, uh, the main points are quite different. First, present levels of global material consumption can continue. Before, the policies couldn't continue, but now the levels themselves, the amount of energy, the amount of materials, the amount of pollution, the amount of people uh, are far, far above sustainable levels. Now, I would say that the decline is inevitable. What's most likely is that it may be chaotic if we don't take command and begin a set of proactive policies. If we do that, I think a peaceful, equitable, and gradual descent is still possible. It's not inevitable, of course, but it's still within the realm of possibility. It's going to require a totally different set of policies and goals and institutions than the ones we talked about 50 years ago. But the sooner we get on with uh, figuring out what they are, the better. So 50 years later, uh, 50 years after Lemons came out, we need to shift our perspective from slowing down to getting back down. And when we come uh, to the latter part of the program, starting to talk about priorities, I'll mention what I see as a number of the key leverage points for doing that. It's going to require whatever uh, path we choose, institutions, goals, social norms, very different uh, than the ones we have today. So that's it. Thank you very much for my very brief retrospective analysis. Dennis, thank you so much. Um, not only were you spot on time, I'd say you were under time. Um, and so we definitely will be tapping into your incredible brain and your thoughts as we move through into the panel discussion, because I think that it's such a privilege to have you on this call yeah. and all of the panel members, as well as those that are joining would very much also love to hear your views as we now are dealing with these 21st century challenges that you so um, importantly revealed. And in particular also, you did bring up some of the work of the club uh, around Earth for All and the thinking and the building of some of the original thinking of the limits to growth. So it's, it's really my deep pleasure to then introduce two of our panelists who are also sitting on our economics commission very much relating to the Earth for All work and the work of the club to try to collaborate with so many uh, other multidisciplinary thinkers, modelers, economists, scientists, and together unpack some of the key challenges facing us. What we wanted to do together today, and Luisa, thank you for joining us, I can see that you're in a train, I think. I don't think you'd be calling in from a plane and I know that that is not your standard practice anyway um, to fly. It's lovely to have you with us. We have a, a very esteemed group here today. Jayanti Ghosh, who is professor University of Massachusetts Amherst and as I said, Earth for All Commissioner. Johan Rockström, who is one of the most esteemed climatologist and also has been working with us, not only in terms of 
thinking through on the commission some of the key tipping points and issues relative to economic change, but also helping us on the modeling with regard to the Earth for All model. And of course, representing Potsdam Institute for Climate. And then Luisa Neubauer, who is the prominent co-organizer of Fridays for the Future, leading in particular also the German efforts, but has been one of the fabulous four young women from Sweden, of course, Germany, and also Belgium, some of my compatriots here who have been fighting Fridays for the Future efforts for the last two years. So the first question that I wanted to ask you as we open up this panel and in reflecting on what Dennis has indicated is what lessons from the limits to growth apply to today's burning challenges? And, and also how do you integrate some of the lessons yourself into, and this is maybe more for Jayati and Johan who have grown up with the limits to growth. So maybe I will start with you, Jayanti. Thank you so much. And it is such an incredible privilege to be on this panel, particularly to be on the same panel with uh, Dennis Meadows. I mean, as you said, we have grown up with the limits to growth volume. I have to say now, thinking about it, that maybe we didn't grow up enough with it, <laughs> that we did not really, any of us fully understand and cooperate, not just how prescient this was, but how important and how fundamental it would have been for us to make those changes five decades ago or to even start making them. Um, in terms of, you know, and I think, uh, you know, Professor Meadows has already identified, I think, you know, the, the essential arguments and, and what it would mean. But I have to, if I had to think back on it now, or if I have to think for the future, which is really what, as you've mentioned, we're trying to do in the Earth for All uh, document as well is that one of the central messages there, which perhaps didn't get as much importance as we should have given it, is reducing inequality. Yes, mm -hmm. equity is mentioned, it's very important, and it's identified there that you need to have an equitable strategy. But I think now we have come to the point where we cannot confront any of these dramatic changes uh, without confronting inequality in assets, in control over resources, and in incomes, and how they are distributed. We know even in terms of carbon emissions, the latest reports tell us how 1% of the world is using 8,000 times what the bottom 50% of the world is, is doing in terms of carbon emissions. And I think that is a proxy for all other overuse of resources. But it's really also that this is not something that has just happened and is inevitable and part of capitalism. It has been enabled by state policies and by the current global and financial trade architecture. So we have a global architecture that privileges profits over people, that privileges the short term over the long term, that privileges monetary GDP over what is truly valuable for humanity, and which does not take into account the essential basic needs of humanity, which are the things required, the, the material things required, but also the other social things required to live a life with dignity. So as long as we do that, we are not going to be able to address these. We're not going to be able to make the shifts that Professor Meadows has uh, pointed out and that were mentioned even in, in that 50 years. I just want to finally just say that, you know, this is not something that, can, uh, that we have to live with. These are all the results of state policies. And so they can be changed. And the note of optimism with which he began and ended, with the note of optimism which even that very pessimistic limits to growth volume had, I think that note of optimism is what we have to retain because we, we can change these if we actually put enough pressure on our governments to move away from these very, very unequal strategies. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jayati, for your reflections. Johan, coming to you, what about your note of optimism? How are you feeling? And also how did the limits to growth influence your life and your thinking? Yeah, thanks. So, so let, let me start by, by making one very objective statement. Dennis Meadows, you are absolutely one of my top heroes in the world. And you've influenced me and so many of my peers in the world. I would say you're, you're the father behind 
system dynamics modeling, what has become modern Earth system modeling. And you're so humble when you always emphasize that you were not doing any predictions, but but you were sitting there with your team um, in the in the early 1970s. You know, it isn't until 2002 that the first idea of the Anthropocene was was put on the table by Nobel Prize laureate Paul Crutzen. It isn't until 2007 that we have all the data on the Great Acceleration. It isn't until 2008 we have the first publications of the tipping points in the Earth system. The Hothouse Earth paper came out in 2018, after all. And it isn't until the last two, three years that we have the Earth system modeling showing that we haven't passed two degrees in the past three million years. And you already 50 years ago basically outlined with such precision the journey of humanity on Earth. So, I mean, it, it's really kudos to, to this extraordinary accomplishment. So it has really guided uh, Sandrine science and our understanding of human relations with the Earth system for, for this whole time. And when I've been dialoguing with the Swedish government in the run up to the Stockholm Plus 50, I've been saying, look at the limits to growth and start that meeting this year, 2022, 50 years after the Stockholm conference with a recognition that we have failed. We, we still follow a pathway to disaster. And, and I think, therefore, what the Club of Rome now also is building on, on the limits to growth with the whole planetary emergency for emergence is, is really so significant. And the IPCC's report two days ago is dramatic. It shows that we are basically in for overshoot. So exactly what the limits to growth showed. And that overshoot will will put us at risk of triggering irreversible changes, impacting, as Jayati said, unequitably communities at, at the level of billions of people. I mean, for the first time, IPCC talks about billions, not millions. So I think the, the, the collapse uh, risks are, are so real and we have to, you know, deviate away rapidly. So where is the optimism? Well, the optimism is the insights we've learned during this whole, <laughs> these five decades, and that we today have the solutions at hand to start accelerating the pathways towards a safe landing. And as Dennis says, it's not anymore about setting the right policies. It's about recognizing hard limits and to affect change within those limits or boundaries. So that's where the Earth for All comes in. And I think we are on quite a good track to really identify the five turnarounds that can take us on a prosperous equitable pathway for humanity within a safe uh, and, and stable earth system so you know it's, it's 50 years gone down the road it's high frustration i think for many of us who've been part of that whole journey of incremental change let's hope that we are entering a phase of transformational change despite the tremendous shake-up in the world as we live in today Thank you, Johan. And uh, I, I wanted to build on what you've just indicated, in particular, the need for transformational change and the sense of urgency with Louisa. Louisa, are you still with us? Because we can't see your video. Yes, I am. I hope you can understand me. Um, yes, I, am, I just we, we can hear you now. to save some internet connection. So if you would be willing, Luisa, to give us your thoughts as to what do you feel are the deep challenges of the 21st century? Were you touched? Did, did somehow the messages of the limits to growth reach you as you went on your own journey? Or what has created your own journey and your way of challenging um, some of the non-transformational changes that you've seen over the last 50 years? as a young activist. Lisa, you're muted. Louisa? Yes, can you hear me? I will try yeah, to keep can. it short. Thank you. Um, it's a very yes. shaky um, connection, wonderful. I'm, um, Johan spoke about the shaky times. I'm on my way because we are organizing spontaneous peace demonstrations and uh, I'm on my way to one of those now. Um, of course, the report has occurred to me. My, my grandmother has been referring to it over and over again. And I'm really worried because I see, I, I find myself today in the position where I repeat the same things that have been on the table 50 years ago. And I do wonder what needs to change. And I think we don't have the answer yet. 
Thank you, Louisa. Um, and, and thank you for continuing to be an activist on all of those very important uh, challenges that are before us. Dennis, just a few maybe reflections on, on what you've heard. And then I know that Mampala has, has a few other questions. So I'm often asked if I'm an optimist or a pessimist these days. And the real answer is I'm neither, I'm a realist. Uh, you know, my training is scientific and my predilection is to look at the situation and uh, see what needs to be done next. Uh, as my mother used to say, when you're in a card game, play the cards you have in front of you. Don't sit wasting your time wishing you had different cards. So what, what does that give us? Well, uh, a key issue is, is sort of uh, what period of time and, and what space are you looking at? You know, optimism and pessimism is vis-a-vis -vis a goal. It's not something in the abstract. So the question is, what's the goal? Well, you know, for the planet, I'm optimistic. It's been here for 4 billion years, and I'm sure it'll be here for another 4 billion years. And I, uh, it doesn't need me to worry about it. It will take care of itself. Our species has been here for in a vicinity of 300,000 years. I'm optimistic for our species. Uh, we have some big uh, problems coming up. As Johan knows, climate is going to produce some very, very significant discontinuities. But actually, our species has uh, survived on this planet under conditions much worse than the ones we're uh, thinking about. Uh, you know, 10, 12,000 years ago, the sea was 120 feet lower than it is now. And we, we came through that period. So I'm, for our species, I'm fine. For our civilization, this particular, especially Western, white, Northern energy intensive civilization, there I'm pessimistic or at least realistic. It isn't going to uh, survive very long. It definitely, will change, but what do you expect? I mean, uh, even in recorded history, we've seen a large number of great empires come and go, and we hardly could imagine that this one isn't going to be subject somehow to the historical norms. Uh, nonetheless, that doesn't mean we have to be passive. We can sit back, understand what options we have and which ones we prefer and figure out how, how to get there. I might say in this connection, I was just, extremely excited when I learned that Johan had left the directorship of the Resilience Institute up in Stockholm and gone down to take over from Johan Schellenhuber in uh, Potsdam, because this combination of uh, scientific understanding of resilience and the realities of climate change are really one of the key areas uh, of research and knowledge that we need now. Uh, the keys are there. So, uh, you know, now let me be a little bit more uh, concrete. Given uh, that we are going to identify the realities uh, we prefer and get on, what, what do we do? I've, I've identified four priorities, which would be my focus if I were starting a new modeling effort now. I'm not, of course, uh, but if I were and wanted somehow to influence what was going to happen over the next decades, uh, I would focus on four things. Uh, the first is to acknowledge the reality of the situation. I mean, it's very nice politically to talk about sustainable development and uh, all this and that, bringing the poor up to the level of the current rich, etc. That's not in the cards. That's simply not going to happen. It, uh, it violates a number of physical laws. And so the first thing is simply to get a comprehensive understanding of what options are really available to us. Then once we've done that, and here is a really crucial thing, start developing a new vocabulary and a new set of images to make that an attractive option. Lisa uh, was talking about uh, you know, what causes change. Well, I've spent 50 years trying to cause change. And I run into the fact that as soon as you tell people growth can't continue, they automatically assume that there's only a catastrophic future available to them. You know, I, I recently told a leading economist, we need to reduce our energy consumption by at least half. His response was, oh, you wanna take us back to the stone age. 
And I said, no, I would like to go back to the United States that way it was about 40 or 50 years ago. It wasn't so bad. Uh, mm -hmm. It's the point mm -hmm. being, there's, there's no nuanced, subtle capacity to think about anything other uh, than this dominant growth uh, paradigm, which underlies not only economics, but also politics. It's the basis for compromise in politics. So the start coming up with some new things. You know, decroissant, deep growth, is just exactly the opposite of what we need. The realities it acknowledges are correct. The goals it has are terrific. The questions it poses are the right questions. But the title connotes a negative outcome. Ask somebody, do they prefer growth or degrowth? And uh, it doesn't take them long to figure out which one they prefer. So we need to come up with some new positive images. Uh, third thing, resilience. Shocks are coming. I mean, they're here. Uh, I used to play the game in my speeches in, uh, I remember uh, in 1900, 19, uh, uh, 2000, sorry. Uh, I'd stand up and say, you know, to understand what an exponential growth curve looks like, just I can tell you that over the next 20 years, there will be more changes than you've seen in the last century. And people simply couldn't understand, couldn't understand that. And yet looking back, uh, I was probably underestimating. I mean, if we see what's going on in Europe uh, today, you know, if I'd mentioned these things even four or five years ago, people would have said, I'm a totally lunatic. So these shocks are coming. And instead of trying to avoid them, certainly we want to minimize them, but at least we have to start creating resilience at all levels, individual, family, home, community, country, global, so that the system can continue to generate equitable, decent outcomes for people, even under conditions of intense shock. That's number three. And four, uh, we need to start respecting the non-monetary aspects of the environment. Unfortunately, the vast majority of policies uh, related to environmental control are couched in terms of costs and benefits for humanity. And of course, our species is a very, very small component of this planet. And the options that we'll have 100 years from now are fundamentally de dependent on what we do these days uh, to the regenerative uh, fertile uh, capacities of the planet. So we need, again, to start developing a science uh, to understand that better and to bring it as an ethical uh, norm into uh, the political discourse. Uh, if we did all of those things with great success, it isn't gonna give us utopia. It isn't going to keep all of us in, you know, looking at each other. I was just looking around at the environments which are portrayed on this screen. Uh, you know, I'm, uh, I'm, and they bring back you know, many memories of, um, I'm looking at Johan, the windows behind Johan, for example. I guess those must be at the Potsdam Institute. I've, uh, if they are, I've been in that office and, uh, and I've been on tra train, et cetera. You know, this, it's very pleasant, but isn't, this isn't going to last. But we can have a society with a billion, maybe billion and a half people, fairly decent standard of living, more or less indefinitely. Uh, but it's going to take some big effort. So therefore, I'm, I hold out high optimism and, and, uh, and hopes and best wishes for what the Club of Rome is undertaking now. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Mampena, do you want to take us to the, the next section? Well, I'm listening to these uh, amazing insights about the lessons learned. And the question now is given that the shocks are not in the future, they're here, the burning issues are here. What extraordinary actions are called for? And I noted that from both Dennis and Jayati, and Dennis has come back to it again, the issue of values and norms 
the non-monetary issues have cropped up. So the question I would like uh, the panelists and of course the audience, uh, larger audience to ponder is what will make it possible for us to take the extraordinary steps that either what uh, Dennis has outlined, the four priorities, and what uh, other people have referred to, including Jayati, given that one of the lessons, certainly within the Club of Rome, uh, after the distribution of that very, very uh, highly regarded report, very little change was visible. Individuals were impacted. Individual institutions were impacted. But in terms of a major shift, we didn't see much of that. And what Dennis is talking about is now where we are, we have to acknowledge that we didn't do the shifts that should have been done. So what are now the extraordinary actions that we have to take, given that it's no longer a question of slowing down, it is a question of really changing track. But when you talk about resilience and the system, I worry about it, Dennis, and because as Jayati indicated, we are in a global system that I don't know that I want it to be resilient as is. I think we need to think about what kind of global system are we re, should we be reimagining where there will be greater global equity and a healthier planet. So I turn it over uh, back to, I'll start this time with uh, Johan and, and hear what, what do you suggest are the extraordinary steps that we have to take. Yes, thank, thanks, thanks, uh, Mampella. And uh, you know, I I think it is um, time for us to to recognize that uh, uh, just like the IPCC report concluded Monday, that uh, you know the window for us to have a safe climate landing is rapidly shutting. The window for biodiversity and resilience is rapidly shutting. We're actually pass passing the first irreversible tipping points, both in coral reefs, Arctic summer ice, potentially the Amazon, potentially the West Antarctic ice shelf. So I think we, we are uh, in an emergency point which requires some uncomfortable decision making in, in, in democratic and equitable circumstances. And that is, of course, very challenging in the middle of a war in Europe. But but I think we are forced to really put these um, policy options on the table. And, uh, and the Earth for All is really trying to do that. And I think one of the first ones is to, to agree um, to put forceful accountability on the phase out of fossil fuel driven economies. And we see that uh, fossil fuels is, by the way, a very significant amplifier of, of the conflicts we're mm -hmm. seeing across the world yeah. today. And I think that can build on Glasgow and it needs some accountability right across that the net zero pathways need to be forcefully, um, you know, not only approved, but also accounted for across the, the economies of the world. The second is that we, we simply have no choice. We have to do exactly what Dennis, uh, uh, the way I interpret it, to put real value on all natural assets in, in the Earth system. So just like Partha Gupta proposed, uh, having a new component of inclusive wealth where we internalize all the externalities, put a price on carbon, but also price and value on all the natural assets that build the basis for human well-being. We can do it. We have the methods. It's a question of forcefully stepping out of our comfort zone and, and doing it. And it's quite interesting that in Europe today, the price on carbon is almost 100 euros per ton of carbon dioxide, which is extraordinary. It's shutting down coal. And then and then the third big item is really to, to build resilient food systems and provision of basic needs for all human societies because we see cascade effects right as we speak where where climate change and ecological disruption is causing displacement migration and conflicts they're amplifying in 
instabilities in societies. And this is hitting the most fragile and it's spilling over into uh, losing economic development opportunities for so large tracts of the world. And I haven't even come to touch on what I really agree with Dennis, which is we need the positive narrative. And, and there is a positive narrative, but I won't, don't want to use more airtime here right now. So those are my, my top priority issues to raise into this moment of emergency. Thank you very much, Johan. Um, Jayati, I want you to also, in responding to the extraordinary actions, uh, deal with the real risk that continents like Africa, which have got unexplored fossil fuel deposits, might just see, particularly in the light of Europe, playing with this idea that gas is green, nuclear is green, what are the implications? Thanks. Thank you so much. And you know, really thank you for these really profound comments coming from Professor Meadows and, and from Johan. Uh, I, I'm actually going to, in a sense, put footnotes to these. Uh, first of all, you know, I agree with the, the, the turnarounds that Johan has been mentioning, but you know, these in a sense cannot be done in the existing global framework. Because currently, it's not just a legal architecture or a formal international architecture. It is the power of large capital supported by states. And that's what you have to confront. You cannot phase down fossil fuels when the biggest funders of fossil fuels are, uh, eight out of 10 of them are financial institutions based in the United States, which are actively supported by the states. And that they are providing up to $2 trillion a year in support of these fossil fuel investments, while total climate finance available for the entire developing world has not even reached 85 billion, supposedly. So we really have to think about how we regulate, what is the role of public spending? How do we generate the revenues for that public spending through taxing the rich? How do we redistribute in a way that provides the minimum conditions for a decent life with dignity for everyone in the globe? in a way which we yeah, are, it doesn't bring people down, but actually makes people uh, you know, live a, a decent life in the North, but most of all in countries where they are unable to at the moment. So I think we have to address this thing about the power of global capital. And there are ways in which we can do it. There are levers that exist today. Having said that, I also just want to make this point. I think Professor Meadows expressed it so well about you know, degrowth versus green growth. I think it's a red herring. We all agree GDP is a terrible measure. It doesn't capture value. It doesn't capture what we in society should value. Why are we fussing about whether it should go up or down? We should not be concerned with that. We should be looking at what are the things we need to provide the minimum conditions for a good life with dignity for our people. Let's think of how we can get those. And let's think of the economy we need to supply those instead of obsessing with whether it has to be associated with a higher or a lower GDP, which I think is a red herring and it is dividing all of us who are really fundamentally on the same side of that particular fence. I want to take up the point, Manfela, you raised, which I think is so important that, you know, often the mitigation strategies, so-called, like moving from coal to, let us say, natural gas and so on, or from moving from natural gas even to other forms, they are very siloed in their approach. They don't recognize the broader ecological implications. We see that even I'm currently in the United States and everybody's green, they all want electric cars and they all have solar powered houses. They're not thinking about the costs or the conditions under which lithium is extracted, the displacement that is occurring, the environmental damage that is occurring. Everybody here is a recycler, right? It's the Northeast of the US. 80% of US waste being recycled and then re in, in terrible conditions and polluting and damaging and hazardous conditions in other parts of the world. So we really have to think of the holistic picture even in terms of mitigation strategies. Uh, final point, you know, the UN FCC, the latest report has a really interesting discussion on maladaptation, which is another huge concern that many of the so-called adaptation strategies right now I think Professor Mendoz mentioned resilience, but how are they seeking to get resilience? By doing these short-term fixes, putting up walls against seas, putting up, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Many of these maladaptation uh, mal measures have massive geographically uh, unequal and other distributive consequences. So we really have to avoid that pitfall as well, that the attempts to cope with these shocks 
can actually make the problem worse as well. So I, I really want to just get back to the point that, you know, inequality is at the heart of this. We cannot address this if we don't confront inequality head on. Thank you, Jayati. Louisa, you represent a generation three steps down from me. And the issues we are discussing here are clearly uh, issues that we, our generations have failed to lead with the next generations in mind. What are the extraordinary steps you as your generation would like to see, not just us, the old golden oldies, but you yourself and your, your peers take to address these yeah. burning issues? Um, very good question. Um, there's there's been so many inspiring thoughts, and just to add one um, one dimension to Jati, because I think it's very very right. We need to look at what are what are solutions and what are big solutions. What solutions are causing different crises, but also um, which solutions are basically just greenwashed solutions as usual, which is you know the taxonomy you touched on earlier. But at the same time, I think it's important to acknowledge the intersection of the problems how fossil fuels are not just destroying livelihoods and ecosystems, but fueling wars like the one we're seeing right now and funding wars in particular. And I mean, just to give it a, you know, feed this with a number, it's $700 million that are being sent to Russia every single day, today as well, from the EU and the US for their fossil fuels. That is what is financing this war. So getting away from the fossil fuel isn't just solving one problem, but it's you know um, at the at the root cause of or the, at the root of what we need to to build upon. And now what we need is unprecedented um, collective action, and that cannot be just on the shoulders of young generations. It cannot be just young people, you know, demanding a right to a future or a right to a present. But that needs to come from all sides. And I think looking at adults, what we need, and the older generations. Yes, you have known all this before and you have advocating this all a long time ago, but for now it doesn't count. For now, it doesn't count if you were right 40 years ago. It counts what you're doing out of this knowledge right now. And just having something written down somewhere a long time ago won't make the difference now because we need to create this momentum that is able to bring us, you know, above the social tipping points that we need to reach right now. And I'm, I, I really see this happening in a lot of places, but sometimes it's, it's a bit irritating to talk to people who, have, you know, who seem to misunderstand that being right about something doesn't change the way things are going. It's about doing the right things, intervening, disrupting where needed. Thank you. That is you. Speak up. Any, it's okay. Okay, sorry, were you done? Yeah, thank you. Dennis, you, you keep coming back to this issue of ethics, of values, et cetera. Could you just help us think about what would be the most effective way of getting that conversation going? Because it's an uncomfortable conversation because it raises the issues that Jayati is raising about what is of value, life, profits, people, uh, e equality, inequality and its costs. Uh, your point about uh, new narratives or new vocabularies, can you help us perhaps find that language that can engage people to really be open to these conversations? Well, thank you, Mabel. I was uh, actually going to acknowledge your earlier statement about the importance of values. You know, it's actually quite a miraculous change. In the early days, the people who took limits to growth seriously started automatically looking for technical fixes, some new technology, some alternative energy source or, or whatever. Uh, it was, I think, uh, based on the desire to let things remain basically as they were, you know, but realistically, if someone is holding a hammer, let's say, and hurting you with the hammer, you don't blame the hammer, you blame the person. And you don't imagine 
that the hurt is going to go away if you give them a different kind of hammer. Uh, so we need to start with the values. We need for people to shift their values. If they do that, then the technologies will come. And in fact, most of them already available. It's easy, and I, I share Lisa's uh, uh, concern to look at the massive forces resisting change and to, to ask this question, how can we get really drastic change going? I'll tell you, it's easier than that. Drastic change is coming. Whether people like it or not, over the next 10 or 15 years, there's going to be massive changes we don't have to persuade people to quit pursuing the current policies because over the next 10 or 15 years, many of those policies are going to fail. They're going to have to quit using them. You know, it's kind of like um, a, uh, imagine you're looking at a big train and you want it to go in a certain direction. You can become very pessimistic about pushing it to get it going. But if the train is already going, all you have to do is find the right switch and then a very small effort will take the train down a different direction. We're looking now for that switch or those switches. The dilemma is that the knowledge the, 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 uh, that we need about those switches needs to proceed by years, uh, that point where people will be ready to use them. I was a policy analyst for 50 years and one of the problems is Fundamental analysis requires time. And the amount of time that you have with a decision maker between when they have acknowledged that what they were doing isn't working and they need something else, it's a very brief interval. They go from saying no change is needed to I don't know what to do to what I'm doing is correct very quickly. And so I remember saying always to my research team, what do we need to be doing now so that five years from now, when the crisis comes, we'll be standing there with a set of recommendations. If we can hit it within a few weeks, we may actually have an impact. And I, I understand that to, to be our, our current situation. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, over to you, Sandrine. Thank you so much, Dennis. And I, I think that we, we have to take into consideration the fact that not only are we all deeply riveted by what is being said right now, both in terms of the challenge at hand, but also in terms of the possible solutions if we used our hearts, our heads and our souls rather than just our egos. We have 104 <laughs> questions that have come in on this panel and we still have 400 people that have stayed with us. So I would like to open up and I know that Till has been trying to sort through some of these questions so that we can also bring in the many people that are with us today. So Till, do you want to have a go at um, throwing out some of the, these themes that you're seeing in the questions? Yes, thank you. And uh, thank you for the exciting conversation and for your engagement in the chat. Um, as Sandrine mentioned, we have more than 100 questions. So we try to address uh, some of them. Um, and uh, thank you for the discussion. I would see four different themes um, that, that we see coming up in the questions. Uh, one very much referring to what happened in the last 50 years and what would uh, we do different now? So Dennis, one question that was voted uh, uh, the most for was asking you, um, if you could travel back 50 years, what would you do? What would you do differently? So that is, that is one theme also in the context of what have we learned? And I would suggest I just summarize the questions and then each of you has the time to reflect on these for uh, two minutes. Another question in that block of what happened in the last 50 years, is um, how do you think that in society, the mindset uh, shift towards environmental protection has changed since the Limits to Growth was published in 1972? And why does that not, is that not reflected in the right policies? So that is the first block, what happened in the last 50 years. The second one 
is very much referring to communications campaign and how do we actually achieve change we know that knowledge doesn't ne necessarily lead to action so one question is referring to for example kate rareworth book donut economics saying do you take hope from the increasing popularity of works of modern campaigners for operating within limits for example kate rareworth with donut economics um, another question to Dennis is what would be Dennis advice to doing better? Should we be louder? Should we be smarter? Do we have to use other ways to make sure that the messages land with the right people? Um, another um, uh, question that, that, that came up is um, what, what are the arguments and framing the panel have found that can prove effective, compelling in conversations with those who are very much benefiting from the current system we're living in and how to uh, approach these people and, and make sure that they become part of the change. The third category that came up um, and, and we see many questions in is the question of who actually leads to change. Is it individualism versus structure? Is it the state versus market? So one question, how do you think individuals can best make a difference? Should we continue to push our governments and then wait for them to make the necessary changes? Or should we begin to reorganize and rebuild our communities in a sustainable way despite lack of governmental action? Um, another question in that block is what is the role the state should play to develop the resilient capacities we mentioned uh, uh, earlier on. Um, so, so this is a lot of questions in that context as well, individualism versus structural change. Um, in that category, also people asked about the role of business. So we know that business is embedded in structures and in a certain system, but what is their role? What can business do um, within the framework they're moving in? And then, uh, interestingly, um, quite some people actually seem to have read the limits to growth and be aware of the content, because we see a lot of questions referring to the problematique, which is a word uh, not uh, many people outside of the club warm world and limits to growth uh, readership might know. But one question uh, in that context is, we see a lot of damage to nature in the name of fighting climate heating biomass damaging rivers, palm oil for uh, biodiesel, etc. What's your position on, the, on this problem? What would be a recommendation for politicians and public? So how to address the problematic? Um, so these are just these are just it's just a brief overview. Um, I know that not we could not answer every, uh, bring in every question, but I think it provides another um, good uh, opportunity for discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Till, and maybe we'll start with you, Dennis. So um, I'll take that one about <clears throat> 50 years ago. <clears throat> the, uh, that there's various uh, components to that. So some uh, people have said, well, you know, uh, the computer technology has changed so much in 50 years. Would that mean you could build better models if you had it back then? The answer is no, and it comes uh, to the point that Montpella made. The crucial issue here is values, social values and ethics. And uh, it's no good having a really uh, elaborate computer if you have a very crude scientific understanding of the system that you're trying to model. Climate change has benefited enormously from modern computers, but uh, global futures hasn't because uh, the level of understanding now isn't that much better than it was 50 years ago. So the technology hasn't made a big difference. Our model was very simple. It didn't differentiate amongst countries. I still think that's the right choice uh, for a variety of uh, reasons. The main point being that it's the whole globe that has to deal with this problem, not an individual country. And we're very ignorant about what causes things to uh, go back and forth across boundaries. We have a better understanding about the, the planetary limits. The big change for me 50 years ago, if I had it to do over again, would not be in the nature of the model or the process of the analysis, but rather in how we carried out the study. We had the very naive assumption that if you do some research, come up with results that are contradictive to the current views, you hand out those uh, results, people will change their ways. I mean, that obviously was a very uninformed uh, understanding of the process. So the biggest change for me would be at the outset to identify key leaders, to have a better understanding about motivations, 
to involve organizations from the outset so that when we finally finished our work, it wasn't a small group of people at MIT unleashing a book on the world, but rather a group of informed leaders saying what they think is necessary for the future. And I'll point out with respect to change, it doesn't need to be everybody. You know, someone asked, how can we get those people to change who have a vested interest in the current state of affairs? Well, forget them initially. We know empirically that change comes from a relatively small group of people. Mm. And the key issue here is not current power, but present time horizon. We need people who are looking out ahead uh, decades and trying to couch the costs and benefits of what they do now in terms of the benefits that will accrue, let's say, to their children. I've always found parents are much more farsighted than national leaders. You know, the national leaders are looking at the next election. And parents, of course, uh, have a much longer time perspective than that. Uh, so those, those are my comments about 50 years ago. Thank you so much, Dennis. And I'm, I'm actually going to bring in, especially on your last point, this very important point, because many of us are struggling around this naive assumption that science and proof somehow will compel leaders to take the right path forward. And I'm going to open this up for a discussion with Jan because actually we both have had this discussion very clearly recently, both as a result of the current climate negotiations and also a result of the greening of certain parts of the energy market like gas and nuclear that we know full well are not actually green. So Johan, building on that and building on some of the other questions, what would be some of your reflections? Yes, thanks. No, I, I as you know, I, I fully agree that um, science and evidence alone does not make change. I'd like to just make one reflection, though, now that we're sitting here celebrating 50 years of insights from the limits to growth, that remember that one thing that science contributes in an incredibly powerful way is to be a slow variable. It is the floor we stand on. It is, you know, the, the persistent struggle of just adding piece of the puzzle of understanding to understanding to understanding. If we didn't have the CO2 measurements of the Keeling curve on Hawaii, we would never have had the IPCC's first assessment and we would never have had any action as we see today. If we hadn't had the, the stubborn, stubborn observations of the stratospheric ozone layer, where the scientists even were so convinced that this was a data error when they started observing the, the disastrous ozone hole over Antarctica, which in the end led, you know, Paul Critson and his team to, 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 to identify and take it all the way to the Montreal Protocol and action that was, you know, that deviated us away from complete planetary disaster, a point where the world actually listened to science. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't totally put, put the, the, the role of science off the shelf, of course, <laughs> there would be a real shot in the foot for an academic, but it's to recognize that, that we hold hands and, and play a special role. And that's one of the questions, who lead the change? I think it's a mistake we often do to put all the responsibility on the shoulder of individuals. It is a systems failure we're facing, so we need system correction, which means that the big political leadership, like Jayati said, we need to correct the failure of the trillions going still into investing into fossil fuels, the 500 billion of direct subsidies and so on and so forth. So I'm, I'm always of the view that civil society, politicians, business and science needs to have this, this ping pong and, and integrity, but ping pong and holding hands in this transition. And let me just close something by saying that, you know, for a long time, we academics were looking at where are the youth in the world because we had year after year, over the past 15 years actually, opinion poll after opinion poll showing that roughly 70% of citizens across the world, particularly young people, particularly women in societies, are really, really trusting science and they're really concerned about climate change. Where are the youth? And in 2018, it exploded and the Fridays for Future rose up 
to the uprising we see today. So we are, I would argue, today in a, in a maturity point that we've never seen before. The Munich Security Conference places climate security at the highest level of threat, even higher than terrorism and, and armed conflict. I think that is uh, a point we weren't in 1972, and now we are there. So I think we're ready to go. I think we shouldn't be so pessimistic when it comes to doing unconventional big steps forward. I agree with Dennis. We will see big turbulence moving ahead, but we can see to it that that turbulence places the ball in the right path rather than in the wrong path, because there is a readiness for a transition towards more equitable and sustainable outcomes, particularly now that technology is so that it gets you know better health, better security, better economy, better jobs. So it's not as if it's a sacrifice anymore. It's a scalable opportunity. So that raises this question of, so how do you communicate with skeptics? Well, the way to communicate with skeptics is not to talk about saving the planet. As Dennis said, the, it, it, <laughs> she will take care of herself. The key is humanity. And the good thing is that sustainability gives a better, more modern outcome for humanity and more peace and more security and more equity. And that narrative we have completely underestimated and not, not cherished and developed properly. And I know that you, Sandrine, are passionate about that with the Club of Rome. I think that is, that is really key, the new narrative, the narrative of success in the transition. Thank you, Jan. And, and you mentioned clearly within that new narrative, the importance of the voice of the youth. And so Louise, I'm gonna bring you in before I bring you in Jayanti, if that's okay. Um, because I would really love to, to think through with you and, and have you reflect on the questions, but also how are you looking at those kind of key game changers? Because clearly for us, you have been a key game changer. Um, where for you are the key game changers and the champions that are going to enable you to get the future that you want? And, and how do you also see the, the major focus areas? Um, some have said it's a value proposition and behavioral change, and we need to rethink consumption. What is, what is keeping you up at night and, and some of your generation in, in that respect? Yeah, let me share um, three three thoughts uh, as long as the connection is working. Uh, first of all, I think there was a big question in the room about individual and structural change. And it very irritates me to put this, uh, to frame it as two things that are, you know, that, uh, where there is an all betw between, because what allows structural change to happen, it's people individually deciding today I'm going to to, to be part of a change, to be the part, I, to be the change I want to see in the world. Mm -hmm. And I often give this example of Fridays for Future. You know, in Germany, we've been striking with over a million people on a single day. And what, that was possible because a million individuals that day considered themselves to be, to be um, important in this, to be someone we are counting on. And very personally, individual on a Friday morning decided today I'm going to make a difference. And they did. And this is, I think, the, the important bit here. It's not about individual structural change. We need big structures to change through people understanding themselves individually as part of a bigger system. Um, but uh, what 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 needs to happen, or what what is a the, the precondition for that, is really people understanding that there is a reason to trust in the collective. And that in particular, you know, with the pandemic isolating people, with with crises and 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 inequality separating people and communities, it's it's become much more challenging. And it's it's actually something that has to do with daring something, with daring greatly to trust in in the community, in the collective, to someone else to be counting on you at this very moment, and at the same time to be able to count on someone else if you can't make that is after all. What, what, what I would define as, as true solidarity. Um, that is the one thing. Then secondly, I think, of course, we need to, you know, with this 50 years anniversary, it seems to me, you know, the, the, the social contract between the sciences and, and, and politics has a bit broken. You know, it, it used to be that science does a research for, for, for governments, for decision makers to make the best informed decisions. It was, it happened. And I mean, we're seeing it this week again with the IPCC report coming up. Um, the knowledge is there, it's out there, but it's been so widely ignored. And I wonder what is the consequence for the science here? 
what is the consequence for those providing the research for then to get ignored for decades? Doesn't it mean we need to, you know, we need to make like we draw consequence of that? Um, IPCC report after IPCC report, it's a, it's a saddest thing that my that brought my grandmother to the streets 50 years ago. So that is making me, you know, that is, uh, I think, a big question on the table. And then when we speak about the Wadi question, you know, after all, I think, yes, we need to, we need to imagine different worlds, we need to change behaviors, we need to talk about the set of values. But honestly, Right now, given the time pressure we're in, I'd prefer we'd, you know, create change just now and create change without waiting for people to be informed enough to, to, to go somewhere. Um, for now, I think it's about creating those alternatives that people can feel and touch and acknowledge as better than the status quo as more um, aspiring as the as a status quo is something that they're willing to work and fight for and i think those alternatives you know right now you know i'm not talking about the eco villages they're great but right now i'm talking about creating those city centers where people and steel and uh, nature have the same rights um, i'm speaking of those laws that actually protect children and elderly i'm, I'm speaking of the the court cases that defend the people at the front lines so I, I think for now, you know, we're not in the position anymore to, to wait for people to magically, you know, understand that there is a behavior need to change. We need to go out there, make things happen and convince, convince the people with what is already there. Because yet, you know, I, we can surely understand the status quo as also a crisis of imagination. People just having a very, very hard time to imagine mm -hmm. that a different and another world is possible and how could they after 50, 60, 70 years of fossil fuel propaganda and PR of, of Hollywood movies telling young people the most aspiring thing to do is to have an own car, to have a big house, to, to fly across the world. That's what I dreamed of when I was 14 too because I was just not a single Hollywood movie where people would take a train. How could I start dreaming about this? And so I think, you know, for now it's creating those alternatives. And then coming to the skeptics. I'm not worried about the skeptics. I'm worried about those people who know enough to get started. And I'm wondering who's picking them up, who's calling them in, who's asking them right now to show up because we have a job to do and we have a future and a present to protect and fight for. Thank you, Louisa. And thank you for that powerful statement at the end. Um, again, it's that accountability principle and that those that are not 100% on the fence, but not really coming out and doing what they should be doing, um, rather than just the denialists and the skeptics. Very appreciate your passion and, uh, and your last point. Jayati, speaking about the skeptics, which of course you account, you speak to all the time, and, and also in terms of the shift that we need to see in most of the world and what that looks like, because we haven't really reflected as much as we should on some of the very good points that you made in your opening remarks around redistribution, paying up, thinking through the equity question in the, the profound issues that are linked to that. You know, this has been such a fascinating discussion. Thank you so much for allowing me to be part of this. And uh, Louisa, I also want to say how much all of us really respect and uh, value what all of you young people are doing. You know, thank heavens you are here and you're doing what you're doing and that there are more and more of you every day. It is possibly one of the few bright spots in a very bleak world, really, you know, so mm -hmm. thank you for that. Uh, but then can I also request for you that, you know, what you're doing is amazing and you're mobilizing more people to come out and demand change, but please now also begin demanding specific policy changes. Because what happens is that, you know, it, there's a general thing created, but then there isn't enough momentum to cause specific changes that are the precondition for any of the other positive changes you mentioned. For example, we have to get rid of fossil fuel subsidies. It's not 500 billion, like we're told all the time. The IMF has come up with a report, the US alone, it's more than $4 trillion, direct and indirect fossil fuel subsidies. The global thing together around 6 trillion. Demand an end to that demand that you have to provide more climate finance to the poor world. I mean, 6 trillion fossil fuel subsidies, 80 billion climate finance. So 
demand more climate finance, demand that they share technologies. At the moment, intellectual property rights are preventing developing countries from being able to use the green technologies that are required to reduce energy usage, to even shift from fossil fuel basis uh, for electrification and all of that. Demand that the inequalities in terms of massive sovereign debt problems huge movements of capital flows that destabilize economies and prevent them from doing the fiscal measures they need to prevent climate change or to adapt to it. Demand, in other words, make specific demands. Because, you know, otherwise there's a general momentum created, but governments can get away without doing anything. And I think now you all, you young people, have got both the... Uh, you know, the credibility and the legitimacy to be able to influence a wider group of people. I do believe that one of the things holding us back is the role of the media. I think it's amazing that many mm. of the things we've talked about here just do not find mention. What is even more striking, you know, uh, the IPCC report is no longer front page news. It, I mean, it was the news of the day and that's it. Yet this is so huge and so major, but it's gone from the news cycle already. So I think somewhere we have to think of the different ways in which we can influence the media, because let us face it, change, uh, this is finally just dealing with this whole thing about how do we change things. A lot of the change is going to be actively prevented by those who benefit from the current situation. And I come back to the point that many large corporations, many global capital, and they're not going to change because they suddenly see the light and become Mother Teresa. They're going to change because they have to. They can be forced to change by major shocks of the kind that Professor Meadows mentioned, but they could also be forced by public pressure in the form of regulation, in the form of the public takeover of certain kinds of activities, in the form of much more investment in the things that really matter to us. So I think we have to recognize that there are people who are actively working against change, that many of them control mm -hmm. the media, in different ways, we have to confront that media, but we also have to bring in policies that limit that power, that excessive power they have over state policies. And finally, in terms of the future, I want to come back to the Club of Rome report. I think one of the things they said was that, you know, it, it's not it's just GDP, you can have more people writing folk songs, right? I mean, really, let's think of a better quality of human life, which means much more investment in the care economy, in the creative economy. Mm -hmm. And I use the word economy advisedly. We are focusing far too much on this absolute number of monetary GDP, which is anything which is transacted, which can include the worst possible things, instruments of death, et cetera. Let us instead focus on the things we value. And I would put care and creative industries at the heart of those. Let's think of giving value to those. Let's think of creating an economy that generates more of that. Thank you, Jayati. And Dennis, I, I, I would like you to, to reflect a little bit because you had your four priorities and Jayati's named quite a few priorities as well. Um, maybe in, in closing, and I see that you've unmuted yourself, so I'd love to give you a few final words and then myself and Mampella will, will try to do justice to this incredible conversation. I, I was reminded by Louisa of something that Herman Daly said, Herman Daly being my favorite economist, he said, you know, you don't need to know your final destination in order to take the first steps. Mm -hmm. And in fact, in the process of taking the first steps, you'll learn things which help you to decide where you want to go. Uh, that's very important because most people defending the current situation demand that you tell them where you're headed before they're willing to make a change. Mm -hmm. And that's, uh, that's unrealistic. On the other hand, although we always have many possible op, uh, destinations, there are some which are totally out of reach. You know, I said at the beginning, you can't predict what is going to happen, uh, but for sure we can predict several things that aren't going to happen. There are some options which are simply not available to us. And it's important to recognize them because politics really at its core is the process of debating which of several different impossible outcomes you best prefer. In ruling out outcomes, that's where science comes in. And I hope that Johan didn't misunderstand my remarks earlier. I'm an avid advocate uh, for good, disciplined, relevant, 
science. It helps us to understand the envelope within which we have to operate. It can't tell us which destination we should prefer. That involves human values and other uh, ethical uh, considerations. But it can rule out a number of uh, destinations that are simply not available to us. And in the process can help us to avoid wasting a lot of resources and becoming frustrated at trying to accomplish something which is impossible in the beginning. And that I, I speak academically, but I mean, there are many concrete realities. I understand, for example, uh, that Germany has recently announced it's gonna become uh, uh, green energy dependent by uh, 2035. That's impossible. Uh, there, if you look at the, the physics uh, of the process, there's virtually no way on earth uh, with anything like their current living standards uh, that they can do that. So rather than spout these politically attractive slogans, uh, which just sets you up for frustration, sit down, do the science, figure out what your real options are. And then as Lisa said, take the first step. Thank you, Dennis. So maybe as we- Quickly. Yes, of course, Louisa, Could I please. quickly jump in there because we're stopping sure. at the station that's where the connection is good. Um, because I think, yes, I think it's important, of course, to go ahead and change things. But I feel it's important to also acknowledge that our political systems and also our individual thinkings are trained to aim for what is already considered possible. And in the world of what is considered already possible, we are living in multiple crises and we're not getting away from them. And to just give an example and a, and a final shout out quickly, just yesterday night, I called my former head teacher and I asked him if he would allow his pupils to go to the streets on a peace strike tomorrow with us. He said, Louisa, I am so sorry. I don't think this is possible because it's too short notice. And I said, I think we are, we are in a crisis and we are, you know, there's also a war happening in Europe. I think we should very much ever think what we consider possible right now, because everything that is happening right now in Ukraine was considered very unlikely and, you know, not possible for many places just a few months ago. And um, we hung up and we were looking at, you know, how we reacted to that. And we decided that maybe, you know, for now, this is not the voice that will break the ceilings with us, but it doesn't mean that there is no ceiling to break for us here. Mm -hmm. And just before I boarded this train, we, we heard that the authorities in, in, in our city in Hamburg have officially allowed all school children to, to leave school tomorrow. And, um, and, the, and my head teacher just texted me and said uh, that he had forgotten that we make things happen that are considered impossible because that's very much a job right now. So I think the impossible and the possible right now, you know, maybe these are not the most helpful categories right now. It's what is necessary and what is needed and it's who is needed. And I can promise you all, everyone is needed. That's the one thing we've learned. Uh, and so on. And that's uh, <laughs> the point if you're in Germany, please come to a protest tomorrow uh, where, we, where we connect the dots between peace and climate justice and in the war that is funded by fossil fuel exports. These things are so interconnected and so interdependent as ever. Thank you, Louisa, and thank you for that very relevant example. And, and I would say a, a shout out to all of us, wherever we may be, to go into the streets. And exactly as we have tried through this conversation to unpack the complexities of a human problematique that was so very well started already 50 years ago through the visionary foresight of Aurelio Pache through the Club of Rome and the 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 asking of Dennis and Dana Meadows and the rest of the MIT team to really address the issues that he was seeing across the globe around the limits to growth. We, as I indicated when we started, put out a statement on behalf of the Club of Rome that very much speaks to what you're saying, Louisa. This is not the time to play power politics. It's not the time to allow for war to steer us away from the task of the existential threat to get fearful. It's actually the time to go into the street and demand systems change and the change to political leaders that are going to give us the enlightened leadership that we need. But you're right, and this is exactly what Dennis indicated as well, that it's not gonna be enough with the proof points. We're gonna to have to create this future that we've all been talking about in the midst of chaos. And we're going to have to figure out how we actually build resilience in the systems. And we're going to have to do it now 
We're going to have to do it in a very quick time. We're going to have to pay up, as Jayanti has indicated so well, in terms of the way in which we address wealth across the globe and think through the responsibility of Western society towards most of the world and ensuring that actually as we ensure human development, we are decreasing, hopefully, conflict and we are decreasing power politics. This is the moment we, we have to rise together against war, towards peace, against climate change and biodiversity loss and social inequality across the globe, not just in one particular part of the globe. And it takes all of us, all generations, to think through what a prosperous, new, equitable economy, finance system, and planet looks like. And that comes to your very important point, Louisa, around not a crisis of imagination, but actually tapping into the core of human imagination. We have to stand up, we have to use our wisdom, we have to use our imagination, we have to use every possible tool in the toolbox to ensure that we actually do together figure out strategically not only what those proof points are, but how we tap into human consciousness and the heart and soul of every single individual to make sure that they're on this journey with us. That's our role, all of us who are trying to do the best we can within this period of complete chaos. And the most important thing is we can't turn our backs on each other. So I just want to thank you for this incredible dialogue. I'd like to pass over to Mampella and to remind everyone to bring a little bit of culture and laughter. When you look at the mission rocket behind us, which was actually developed by a comic strip, Tintin, Tin, and remind ourselves that our mission is not a mission to the moon, but actually to preserve planet Earth, to ensure that we continue to bring more laughter, more culture, more love in our realm, and to ensure that we co-create that future we all deserve. Mampella. You're on mute, Mampella. I just want to add my voice to, of gratitude for this amazing discussion we've had from those who sent in their questions, who registered and sent in their questions and participated so ably. But I think what has come through today is that what really matters most is life. And life is relatedness. You cannot have life as an individual. It is the relatedness that keeps life going. And therefore, what we value and the values that drive how we behave have to be those values that promote life in its fullest for everybody. COVID has taught us that well-being for some is well-being for none. And as Jayanti has reminded us several times today, inequality is expensive, not just for poor people, but for everyone. And what I really do want us to bear in mind is that when we speak of we, we must be mindful that most of the world hasn't got the experience that we take for granted. So that this issue of inequality is not just in monetary terms, is also in terms of whose voice gets to be heard, in what way, in what forum. And so if we're talking about the media, the media also has to zoom in on those parts of the world that suffer in silence and off the, the, the bling of TV cameras. Thank you very much. Thank you particularly to Dennis for honoring us and thank you to each one of these, of the panelists here, you have enriched us. And we at the Club of Rome will move into this year of celebrating these, this anniversary with greater strength, but also greater courage. Thank you.